Lord Fox is a journalist, author, and research analyst. His book, Edwin, The Rise and Fall, was one of the first comprehensive accounts of the Edwin saga. He worked as a writer and editor at Business 2.0 magazine and other publications, and his writing has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, and elsewhere. Since 2012, Lord has been a director of research at Money Media, a division of the Financial Times. He has been quoted in the New York Times, the Associated Press, and other media, and, he, and he's a frequent speaker at investment industrial conferences. He also happens to be my dad. This morning, this morning Lord will present to us on the unheeded lessons from Enron 15 years later. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. That was a very articulate introduction. Thank you to the society for having me here. Can everyone hear me? Great. And thanks to all of you who are here today for this presentation. Um, this December will mark 15 years since Enron went bankrupt. It was, at the time, the largest bankruptcy in American history. And it has, its downfall holds a lot of lessons that are still relevant today. Um, and they're very relevant in the presidential election, which is, which is uh, really taking it to a new level now. So now is a very good time to talk about it. Let's not wait till December. Let's talk about Enron now. Um, before I talk about Enron's fall, it would be helpful if I can just briefly go over the history of capitalism. So I, don't worry, I'm not really going to go over the whole history. But I want to make a, an important point, and that is, you know, the, the, the beginnings of modern capitalism really had its seeds in this book, The Wealth of Nations, which was published in 1776 by philosopher Adam Smith. Smith was, um, his last university job was as a professor of moral philosophy. And uh, in The Wealth of Nations, he laid out some of the core principles of what has come to be known as capitalism. Uh, and one of the main ideas that he really articulated for the first time was this idea of the market as this entity. That um, regular people just pursuing our own self-interest, not necessarily selfishness, but our own regular self-interests, um, buying and selling, going to work and earning wages, together our collective actions created a market that set prices and could allocate resources. If if I wanted to buy bread, and Hazel wanted to buy bread, and, and David wanted to buy bread, we set the market for how much bread should cost. And over time, our preferences for bread would help decide should more wheat be grown, more rye, whatever. And that this would be, this was more efficient than if the government set the price or dictated uh, what should be grown and how the economy should be run. Now, there were many good things about this. Uh, and it was a very powerful idea because if you recall in 1776, it was the heart of the Enlightenment. This idea of our individual actions together setting our destiny with, and being more effective and more powerful than any destiny laid out by either monarchs or religions was very much of a piece of the Enlightenment project. Um, and actually it was, these ideas, these Enlightenment ideas, helped inspire the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Actually, Benjamin Franklin was one of Adam Smith's friends. Now, unlike some followers, uh, later, in later years, Adam Smith knew that markets are imperfect, that people would try to manipulate them. In fact, in his book, The Wealth of Nations, he talked about how um, uh, you know, stores uh, shopkeepers would naturally want to conspire on prices instead of allow competition in the market. But this idea of the market as an entity, that this idea that the market was an invisible hand that would help guide the economy was very powerful and it continues to hold that power today. And it was an incredibly important force for the company Enron. Now the market that Enron was in was the natural gas market. Natural gas is very much like oil. It's basically made of the same stuff, smushed up dinosaurs and plants. Uh, and you pump it out of the ground the same way. It's used for fuel and other things. Um, but unlike oil, which is a liquid, it's a gas. Basically, natural gas looks like this. 
<laughs> and uh, so it, had to be, it has to be carried through pipelines using pressure to push it along across states. Now, in the 1970s, the natural gas industry was very heavily regulated by the government. The government decided what the prices should be, both in terms of when it was coming up from the ground and the prices that it could be sold to the local natural gas utilities uh, and also to, to factories. Uh, deregulation or lifting these these rules started in 1978 under President Carter. And what that did at first was it meant that the uh, government was no longer setting the price of the natural gas that was being sold to the pipeline companies. So the pipeline companies bought the gas from the gas producers who were pumping it out of the ground and then the pipeline companies were kind of the middlemen and they sold it to gas utilities or to factories that used it. So in the 70s, government was setting the price and because of that, there wasn't a lot of gas being produced. So there was a shortage of gas and the pipeline companies entered these long-term contracts, 10, 20, 30 year contracts for the gas to make sure they had enough. Once that price was lifted, the market set the price of natural gas. And then more people started pumping gas out of the ground. Then a recession hit and the demand for gas fell. So now there was an oversupply of gas. Because of this, the pipeline companies had this excess gas that they were trying to sell. So they created a spot market. So instead of selling gas for 20 or 30 year contracts, they were selling like 30 day supplies of gas where the price was set on the spot. Now, one of the pipeline companies that was doing this was a pipeline company called Houston Natural Gas. And working there and who was helping lead the charge was a man named Kenneth Lay. Kenneth Lay, yes, Kenneth Lay, <laughs> happened to be trained as an economist. In fact, he had worked for a couple of years at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is the little known agency that oversees the natural gas industry. Um, then he joined the industry and he really helped push this spot market, which was kind of the first open free market um, that Adam Smith would applaud in natural gas. Uh, he lived in Houston. Uh, he aspired to be part of high society in Houston, giving money to political campaigns, donating money to the Houston Ballet, etc. And he was really one of the driving forces behind the birth of Enron. In 1985, Houston Natural Gas, his company, merged with another pipeline company called Internorth, and that formed a new company called Enron, and Kenneth Lay was named the CEO and the chairman. Now, what also happened in 1985 was the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission passed another law that basically forced the natural gas pipeline companies to separate the business of moving the gas through the pipes from the business of selling the natural gas to the end users. The business of selling the gas became unregulated completely. In 1988, Kenneth Lay gathered the employees in a big meeting and said, this is our future. We will embrace deregulation. So Enron began to innovate in the natural gas business. They created a gas bank to pool their supplies of gas so that then they could make sure that they could transport gas all around the country, kind of the way um, a bank uh, pools all of our deposits to loan it out. Then, a couple of years later, they started to finance drilling more gas wells. To make sure they had more supplies of natural gas, Enron loaned money to gas producers to drill more wells. But instead of being repaid with money, Enron was going to be repaid with natural gas. Kind of like banks making loans to small businesses hoping to be paid off later when the businesses flourish. Now these deals were structured in special trusts called special purpose entities. These were separate legal entities that were not part of Enron. And um, this is an important structure because Enron used it later. So basically, you have the special purpose entity which existed as its own, think of it as its own little company. And it's backed with the assets by the, the natural gas fields that are going to be drilled by the natural gas producers. Enron loans it money and gets paid back natural gas. The natural gas producer gets the money to drill more wells. In fact, this became so successful that Enron 
actually pooled together some of these special purpose entities and then sold off pieces of them to banks that wanted to invest in them. Um, and this raised almost a billion dollars just in the first two years of doing this. So by doing this, Enron helped create this natural gas trading market. Now natural gas, unlike oil, uh, has prices that vary around the country based on weather dictating demand and pipeline capacity dictating supply. So the price of natural gas might be very different in New Mexico versus West Virginia, unlike oil, which is easily transported and is pretty much the same price per barrel all around the country. So Enron made sure that it had contracts in place so it could deliver gas everywhere in the country. In fact, Enron became the biggest trader of natural gas in just a couple of years. In fact, it helped develop this market by acting as a market maker, meaning that it stood ready to make trades just to keep the flow of trades going, even if they weren't sure they were going to make money at it. it also, Enron also pioneered adding derivatives, financial derivatives, to gas contracts to help um, manage the prices. So what kinds of derivatives? These are some, you know, you've heard probably the word, the terms derivatives a lot, particularly in relation to the global financial crisis. So two of the most basic kinds of derivatives were futures contracts. So that's basically a contract that commits you to buy or sell something at a specific price at a specific date in the future. Futures contracts had been used since the 19th century in agriculture. It was very, very helpful. Imagine that you, are, uh, you have a factory that bakes cookies and you want to secure what you're going to pay for sugar six months from now. So you might buy a, a futures contract on that and now you know what the price of sugar is going to be for your cookies and you can focus on baking. You don't have to worry about that aspect. Another kind of derivative is an option. The option is kind of like a futures contract, but it allows you to buy or sell at a particular price in the future, but it, you don't have to. So for example, you might, have, you might be a farmer and you have an option to sell your eggs in a few months at a dollar a dozen, but you could see what the market is. And when the time comes, if eggs are actually selling for a dollar 10 a dozen, you don't have to use that option. Instead, you can then just you know, sell them on the open market and make more money. And these are just two of the, of the kinds of derivatives that Enron could attach to natural gas supplies to help manage risk and manage prices. And this helped their trading business grow. And in fact, they started to trade m more of these financial contracts than the actual natural gas itself that they were delivering. To run Enron's trading business, they hired a man named Jeff Skilling. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Skilling was um, a graduate of Harvard Business School. He had worked at McKinsey and Company, the big consulting firm. Um, he joined Enron in 1990 to run their gas trading business. And eventually he would rise to become the number two person in the, in the company behind Ken Lay. And he was, uh, everyone that I talked to for my book said he was very smart um, and he also would back that up <laughs> himself. He was, he was eager to do that um, and that he was very ambitious and he wanted, one person told me he really wanted to change the world. So one of the things that he did was he expanded Enron's trading in a few years into electricity. Now electricity was also starting to get deregulated. In 1992, the Energy Policy Act created a wholesale market for electricity. Hooray, deregulation. Um, and so it enabled and encouraged more power plants that were not owned by utilities to spring up and sell their electricity to whoever wanted to buy it and then it could just be transmitted across power, all the power lines that run across the country. Enron conducted its first trade in electricity in 1994. In order to really dive in and learn the market and become a bigger player, Enron even bought the electric utility in Portland, Oregon for $2 billion in 1997. Now, Enron's biggest involvement in, in electricity came in California. Now, Enron was a big proselytizer for deregulating the electricity markets. And state by state, different wholesale markets for electricity started to spring up. Um, California was the biggest. 
California deregulated its wholesale electricity market in 1998. What happened was the, the electric utilities in California sold off all their power plants and all decided that they would be buying all their electricity from this central power exchange, like a, a stock market for electricity. But Enron and other companies that traded electricity were able to manipulate the market pretty easily. Um, once summer hit and the demand for electricity to power air conditioners uh, started to affect the demand, Enron and the other companies collaborated together to create fake shortages of electricity. They would sometimes shut down power plants to, to create temporary shortages. And Enron and other traders would collude on prices. The prices for electricity that the electric utilities had to buy quadrupled in a matter of months. Enron made millions of dollars. One of the problems was that California had set it up in a really stupid way. I mean, if markets are going to work, you really need rules that are effective and sensible. And in California, what they did was they said, the electric utilities cannot sign long-term contracts for electricity. They would have to go to this spot market and buy electricity on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis instead, because they were afraid that they would get locked into higher prices. California just assumed that deregulation would lead to lower prices. It didn't. So California had to wind up imposing price controls and redesigning its entire electricity market. Now, meanwhile, Enron's uh, gas and electricity trading business was growing bigger and bigger. One of the things that it did was they used a kind of accounting called mark-to-market accounting, which, was, which allowed the company to book all the potential profit from a deal on the day it was signed. Now, this was not best practices. I'll give you an example. If you, have a, if you sign a contract to sell a million dollars worth of natural gas to a buyer over 10 years, you should recognize $1 million a year for 10 years. Enron recognized all $10 million at once. And the employee who originated that deal got paid their bonus based on the $10 million right away that year. So then if something went wrong, like in year three, the employee had very little incentive to fix it because they already got their bonus for the whole 10 years. Again, for some reason, Enron's accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, approved using this accounting method and, and it was okay with the SEC. But what this did was it made Enron's profits look better than they really were. So, Enron started to become a bigger and bigger success in the trading business. As I said, what they called the financial trading, which was the money that was moving around, outgrew the physical trading, i.e. The, the actual buying and selling of the natural gas that actually wound up getting delivered. They opened a trading business in London in 1994. They started doing more complex deals like options to buy options on gas. Um, now, Enron did have rules in place to limit the amount of risk their traders were supposed to take. But they broke those rules all the time. I mean, it was like a speed limit on a lonely Utah highway. People just <laughs> blew through them whenever they were doing well. One trader that I talked to said his best day ever, he made in one day $26 million. And then the next day, he lost $13 million. Yeah. So Enron was becoming more and more like an investment bank. Now, the thing to understand is people like trading. People have always traded. We are poetic creatures, we're philosophical creatures, but we're also economic creatures. So actually, we've been using derivatives for thousands of years. In fact, the first written law that we have found that relate to de using derivatives was found in the Code of Hammurabi in ancient Sumeria almost 4,000 years ago. The first options that we can find a citation of were in the writings of Aristotle. And the first futures market, which was for rice, was developed in Japan by 1700. But one of the things that happened in the years leading up to Enron's rise was that this financial engineering got taken to a new level with a couple of innovations. So, People had been using futures contracts on agriculture for many, many years. 
But in 1972, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange invented financial futures. These were futures contracts on foreign currencies. That exchange and other exchanges soon added other financial futures, futures on interest rates, futures on stock market indexes, and soon those overtook the commodity futures. In fact, financial futures now make up more than three quarters of all futures trading. Now again, in some instances, this proved very useful for managing risk, um, but also very useful for speculation. And the options market had, an, had its own, this is, this is just a, a, a almost incomprehensible portion of the Black-Scholes pricing model, which economists came up with in 1973 to make it easier to price options so that the value of the options uh, could better take into account future price volatility. And this made it much easier, and the option, use of options exploded after this. Fortunately, it, this also happened around the time that desktop computers started to become more popular, especially in Wall Street trading desks. But one of the things that was so interesting was that finally this kind of more complex mathematical approach to trading and financial engineering on Wall Street brought Wall Street closer together with economists in this amazing alliance to make economics more important. And one of the things undergirding this was this kind of slow elevation of economics as a profession, which um, had a milestone in 1969 when Sweden's Central Bank launched the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. Now, economists were being lauded just as physicists and chemists and biologists had been. And economists could feel really proud of themselves. Yes, we're like real scientists, even though we all know it's just a social science. But, um, and in fact, here's, uh, this is a picture of Robert C. Merton, who's one of the people who created that Black-Scholes options pricing model, winning for 1997. And I include this picture because who won these Nobel Prizes? Who's been winning the Nobel Prizes for economics? Is it mostly economists worrying about the poor? No. In fact, 70% of the, of the economists who've won the Nobel Prize so far are American and British economists who work in that whole free market tradition and supported this, the dominant philosophy or the dominant economic philosophy that has emerged in recent decades called neoliberalism. So neoliberalism, unlike the liberalism in American politics, gets its name from the idea of liberating business from government control. And it kind of harkens back to some of the ideas that Adam Smith set forth. And some of the major tenets are preferring market-based solutions to government solutions, Deregulating, meaning lifting rules on businesses so businesses can operate with fewer rules or guidelines. Privatizing businesses, so if there are government-owned companies, they should be sold to the market so that they can you know, be part of the private market. Shrinking government spending and eliminating trade barriers, um, including such packs as, who remembers, NAFTA or this uh, TPP that people are talking about in this election. So, boo, yes, yeah. so globalization, free trade. And neoliberalism was embraced by not just Republicans, but by Democrats. I mean, you can see it in the way the Clinton and Obama administrations have supported free trade. You could see it in the way that President Carter and then Clinton supported deregulation. It has become a kind of dominant philosophy. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's all bad or that these economists had ill intent, but um, it became so dominant that even other economists were not really critiquing it. And uh, it went hand in hand with this alliance of Wall Street types, and economy, free market economists as economics and finance became more and more complicated and more and more jargon filled and less and less understandable by the regular person. And this was partially on purpose. You see, 
Often on Wall Street, you find the kind of smug, patronizing type of person who will say, oh, this is too complicated for regular people to understand. You should leave it to us experts. And there are two reasons why Wall Street types love to obfuscate things and use jargon. First is, playing up the complexity makes it more fun to be part of your secret fraternity. If I say securitization and he says credit default swaps, then I get led into the clubhouse. But there's a political reason as well, and that is the intentional manufacture of doubt and confusion so that people don't pay attention. So that regular people go, oh, I should just leave it to the experts on Wall Street. And not just regular people, but politicians, both Republicans and Democrats. Oh, this guy knows the markets. I should just do what he says. Now, Enron embodied pretty much all the tenets of neoliberalism, including globalization. Enron was expanding overseas, although it was kind of a struggle for them. There are two big overseas efforts. One was they agreed with a, the state of Maharashtra in India to develop a $2 billion power plant. Um, the power plant in Dabal, which is not far from Mumbai, uh, was criticized from the beginning as too expensive. Uh, the World Bank would not loan money for it, and so Enron had to find other financing to get it built. There were protests about it. Um, the protests were met with a violent crackdown that drew the rebuke of Human Rights Watch, uh, who, which, which also criticized Enron for their role in encouraging this. Finally, it opened in 1999, and when it opened, the electricity was indeed too expensive for the state government in India to buy, and after two years it was shut down completely at a, at a big loss to Enron. Enron also got into the water business. It bought a water utility in England. It invested in water uh, utilities in South America um, with the idea, ooh, water is kind of like gas and electricity, and maybe we could figure out a way to trade water and whatever. And water was very difficult, very expensive. They ran into a lot of problems. And eventually, in just three years, they had to take this separate company they had set up called Azurix and fold it back into Enron, um, where it kind of disappeared, again, at a loss of many tens and tens of millions of dollars. Now, all these expensive losses and efforts were not good for Enron um, because Enron's finances had to look good because it was a publicly traded company. They had to stop trading on the stock market and everyone could see what their finances looked like. Enron was very worried about its balance sheet. The balance sheet is that financial statement that shows a company's assets and its liabilities. And Enron wanted to limit the amount of debt and risk that showed on its balance sheet. So how was it gonna do that when it was racking up these losses? So you remember that before I mentioned special purpose entities. These were these special little trusts that Enron set up to help finance gas producers. So they adapted that. They created a special purpose entity and the first one they did was in 1997. It was called Chuko. It was named after the Chewbacca character in Star Wars. <laughs> yes, it's a major corporation at work. And and uh, Enron had had a joint venture business they had with CalPERS, which is the, the California Public Employee Retirement System. It's the big pension fund for everyone who works for the state of California. It's, it's huge. So they invest in all kinds of things because they have a lot of people whose pensions they have to pay. Um, and they wanted to do a new deal with CalPERS. And so en CalPERS said, okay, buy out our share, our half of this joint venture. But Enron didn't want that half to show up on its on its books. So they created a special purpose entity which, exist, which counted as an independent trust or independent entity from Enron. And so they didn't have to show it on its books. They bought it. They contributed the $383 million that they paid for the half of the joint venture with the pension fund. They got some outside equity from Barclays Bank and then it was managed by an Enron employee who worked for the chief financial officer at Enron. 
which if you think sounds like a potential conflict of interest, it was. And Enron's board had to approve that, and en Enron's directors got faxed some sheets of paper and basically said, you have like three or four days to say yes or no, and of course they just said yes. Now the interesting thing is the rule about special purpose entities at the time, because in, if, if it was all assets that Enron had bought, it would just be part of Enron, and so Enron would have to kind of show it as part of its own company. But if they had an outside investor that contributed some percentage, then they could count it as independent, as a separate entity from the company of Enron. Do you have any idea what percentage the outside investor had to contribute under the accounting rules? They had to contribute 3%. I don't make the rules. <laughs> so they contribute, so Barclays Bank agreed to contribute just 3% to make this count as an independent special purpose entity. Chuko kept the debt from the previous joint venture, venture off of Enron's books and it counted as, as, as independent because Enron had this 3% from the outside investor. But here's the thing. In order to get Barclays to agree to invest this 3%, Enron agreed to guarantee it. They basically said to Barclays, you cannot lose this money. So it was essentially loaning the money to Barclays. Years later, the accountant said, you know what, actually, because they didn't, this 3% was not even at risk, it doesn't really count as an outside investment. But Enron's board okayed the deal without questioning it. And so Enron, after creating this special purpose entity, thought, let's do more. So this became the template. They would create these special purpose entities, the SPEs, 97% would be contributed, would be backed either by loans or Enron stock, no risk there. 3% would get contributed by some outside investor, which usually was backed by some loan from Enron, so it wasn't really independent. And then Enron would sell it debt and assets to keep it off of its books. Some of these special purpose entities were even managed by the chief financial officer of Enron, who paid himself millions of dollars over the course of several years to manage this, in addition to what he was getting paid at Enron. Even though, and Enron's board was okay with this, even though he was running these special purpose entities that was doing deals with Enron, and he, so he was kind of doing deals with himself. And, but Enron continued with this this model. Um, and they created many more special purpose entities over the years with names like LG, LJM, Raptor. Yes, they, he had seen, he was also a fan of Jurassic Park, so Raptor, um, and dozens more, each one riskier and riskier. And was all done to hide Enron's debt and risk. Now, why was Enron doing this? Why was Enron so focus on hiding its debt and risk because Kenneth Lay, Jeff Skilling, and the other executives were obsessed with pushing Enron's stock price up continuously because, like so many executives at the time and now, a lot, most of their pay came from stock options. Again, those derivatives that we talked about a few minutes ago, options to buy the company's stock if the price hit a certain level. Stock options were so popular that that they went from being just a small portion of, of executive pay in 1990. By 2001, it was half of CEO's pay. And it was, it was really what supercharged executive compensation soaring over the last 20 years. Ken Lay made so much from stock options that in 2000, he made $123 million just from using the stock options he was awarded. And in the same year, Jeff Skilling made $62 million from his stock options. So there was a lot at stake for everyone. Now, Enron didn't want to miss any beat. And one of the big trends that they were keeping their eye on in the late 90s was the internet. And Enron wanted a piece of the internet action because it was really lucrative. I don't know if you remember, but it, it was like there was a time on Wall Street when 
the internet was just everything, and everything was going to happen on the internet. Not like today. <laughs> so Enron created um, an internet business for trading called Enron Online. What was, it launched in 1999 with gas trading. But they soon added coal trading, electricity trading, pulp and paper, metals. They even started trading internet bandwidth. The idea was to create this platform they, they, where everything could be traded. Anything that could be bought and sold could be traded. But here was the thing. It was not a neutral exchange like a stock exchange where Enron was bringing buyers and sellers together to interact with themselves. The way Enron was making it work was that Enron was involved in every trade. It was as though everything that people wanted to sell on eBay, we were all selling to eBay. And then it was eBay's responsibility to sell it back to other people at a profit. It was hugely risky. And it really depended tremendously on Enron being given a lot of credit because billions and billions of dollars worth of trades were happening every day because it grew so quickly. But because it was growing so quickly, it became the top growth opportunity at Enron. Enron, quick, Enron had risen and its stock price kept going up and so it had become this very well-known successful company. They were celebrated for being innovative and successful. Ken Lay was on magazine covers. Jeff Skilling made the cover of Business Week. In 2000, Enron was named the best company to work for by Fortune magazine a year before it went bankrupt. <laughs> so Enron was rising in esteem and success and, and you know, uh, the aura of success based on its pursuit of all, this, all these tenets of neoliberalism, basically. Now, let's check our handy neoliberalism checklist to see how Enron was doing. So let's see. Market-based solutions, check. Deregulation, check. Privatization and globalization, check. Ah, the last thing is, the last tenet of, uh, is uh, shrinking government spending. Now, Enron as a private company couldn't actually shrink government spending. But it could support the, comp the, the political party that wanted to shrink government spending. And boy, did it. So from the early 90s, Kenneth Lay and Enron were big supporters of the GOP. Lay chaired the Houston Host Committee for the Republican National Convention when it was held in Houston in 1992. Lay and Enron donated millions over the years to the Republican Party. Lay and other executives even donated $300,000 just to Bush's presidential inaugural, not just his campaign, the inaugural that was being held in 2001. Um, Lay and his wife, who had been supporting Bush since his first run for governor in 1994, they, they got to know each other. I mean, they were not best buddies, but they got to know each other well enough that they would send each other birthday cards, and President Bush gave him the nickname Kenny Boy. And then in 2001, when Bush and Cheney, or really Cheney, was developing the energy policy for the administration, they, he called Kenneth Lay in, and they sat down, they had an hour-long closed-door meeting where Kenneth Lay got to tell him what he thought that American energy policy should be. An opportunity that I'm, I think all of us were given, right? No. So this political influence was tremendous and very useful in many ways. One of the ways it was very useful um, in particular was with this Enron Online business because Enron Online was not regulated. And what was going on in the year 2000 was the government was looking at the regulation of commodities exchanges. There was something called the Commodities Futures Modernization Act, which was going, working its way through Congress. But it was interesting because it wound up being written specifically to exempt from regulation the online exchanges where the exchange operator is involved in all the trades. In other words, that operated just like Enron Online. In fact, Enron Online was the only exchange that met the qualifications of this exemption. In the industry, even before it was signed into law, it was known as the Enron Exclusion. So it was signed into law by President Clinton in December of 2000. I 
don't want to criticize him too much because he probably was just doing what the Wall Street wizards in his administration were telling him to do. Um, but an interesting side note, it was pushed hard by um, Congressman Phil Graham, who was a powerful con Republican congressman at the time, and whose wife, Wendy Graham, just happened to be on Enron's board of directors at the time. I'm sure that they never talked about it, though. So here we were, 2001, Enron was seemingly at its peak. Uh, Enron's name was on a baseball stadium in Houston. The top executives were on magazine covers. The chairman, Kenneth Lay, was pals with the president. But all of those losses that they were trying to hide, all those problems that they were <clears throat> covering over with those special purpose entities would not go away. And eventually they bubbled up and Enron started to unravel. And when the unraveling started, it, it, it happened very quickly. In October of 2001, Enron announced that because they realized they had to take some losses on one of their special purpose entities, they were lowering the value of the company by a billion dollars. All of a sudden, everyone was like, what? What special purpose entities? What, what's going on? A few days later, Enron announced that the Securities and Exchange Commission would investigate its special purpose entities, of which it had dozens. A few days later, Enron announced that if they pull some of those special purpose entities into the company like they were supposed to, it actually changed. Remember all the profits that we made in 1997, 98, 99, and 2000? We have to restate those financial state, all those financial statements, and our profits for those four years were much, much lower. So confidence immediately began to evaporate in Enron. The stock price started to plummet. People who were companies that were trading on Enron Online immediately stopped giving Enron credit. It was all based on trust. And all of a sudden, huge parts of the company were basically shut down. No one will trade with a company that has no trust in the marketplace. They won't give them credit. Enron tried to sell itself, uh, and they had a deal in place, but then the, uh, the buyer uh, backed out because Enron's losses kept coming so quickly and they kept restating their finances. Finally, on November 28th of 2001, Moody's and Standard Poor's and the other credit rating agencies said, that's it, Enron's bonds are now junk status. And on December 2nd, Enron declared bankruptcy. The company was finished. They could no longer do business and it was broken up and sold off in pieces. And the only asset that actually had any value when it was left was the original regulated pipeline business. Now, Enron's stock price plunged. This was the stock price in the late 90s going all the way up, and then really in the second part of 2001, zoom, all the way down to nothing. Now, unfortunately, when Enron went bankrupt, there was, there was a human price to be paid, 4,000 employees lost their jobs, and many of those employees had been convinced by Enron executives to put their retirement savings in Enron stock, and so many of them lost those savings as well. One Enron executive felt so bad he took his own life. It also resulted, <clears throat> excuse me, now Enron's fall also resulted in um, criminal charges. So the chief financial officer cut a deal with the feds. He got two years in prison and he testified against um, Kenneth Lay and Jeff Skilling. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth Lay was convicted of multiple counts of securities and wire fraud. He died before he um, uh, wound up going to prison. But Jeff Skilling was, was indicted on, uh, was um, found guilty of multiple counts of securities and wire fraud and insider trading and he went, wound up in prison. Enron's fall also sparked a new law called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. This created a new board to oversee public accounting firms because uh, Arthur Anderson had approved all of these horrible, horrible decisions. And then when they felt that the feds were closing in, decided to shred documents. 
So they, Arthur Anderson went out of business. Um, the Sarbanes-Oxley required that corporate boards of directors have independent audit committees that would actually understand deals, supposedly. And it required the CEO and the CFO of a, of a public company to personally approve the company's financial statements. When the global financial crisis happened and Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, the CEO of Lehman Brothers said, oh, I, but I didn't really understand the financial statements. <laughs> so Sarbanes-Oxley was kind of a slap on the wrist kind of law, kind of like mm, Dodd-Frank in its way. Um, lost my pages. So what went wrong with Enron? A number of things. So they took a decent side business, which was energy trading, and they turned it into a whole industry that really was not sustainable. They used financial engineering to enable their overconfident, hubris-filled executives to take on more and more risk and more and more debt. The board of directors wouldn't or couldn't provide oversight Regulators relied too much on the discipline of the market to regulate the industry. And when Enron fell, pundits blamed a few bad apples, not the structural incentives that encouraged their bad behavior. And all of these things happened again when the global financial crisis hit. You may recall that what went wrong with the global financial crisis? They took a decent side business, in this case mortgage financing, and inflated it into a whole industry. Financial engineering in the form of mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations enabled overconfident financial executives to take on more and more risk and more and more debt. Their boards of directors wouldn't or couldn't provide oversight. And the regulators, were, who were too cozy with the big banking firms to begin with relied too much on the discipline of the market to regulate the industry. You might recall Alan Greenspan after the financial crisis hit saying, I didn't think that the banks would be that greedy. So what did this mean for the neoliberalism true believers? Did the the Enron fraud and the global financial crisis coming so soon together shake their confidence? No. In fact, they doubled down. After the global financial crisis, many people were questioning one of the uh, economic theories called efficient market theory. And this was the idea that financial markets are perfectly efficient. This was um, uh, uh, the father of efficient market theory was uh, an economist named Eugene Fama who Yes, won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> when the New Yorker asked him afterwards, does, does the financial crisis, what does that mean for your efficient market theory? He said, quote, I think it did quite well in this episode. Does that sound like science or dogma to you? So just some closing thoughts. Some things that I want you to keep in mind. First of all, markets are us. As I hope I showed in, this, uh, in my presentation, markets are designed by people and they follow the rules that we set or that are set by people we elect or we appoint. So we don't have to bow to markets. Markets don't have to have power over us. We can control markets if we choose to. Wall Street is just like any other street. Really, it has just as much dog poop as 64th Street. It isn't people with wizards, and the people who work there don't have magic. It's all, right? And so it should be held accountable, just like Main Street. Finance is everybody's business. And if anyone tells you different, they're trying to keep you out of that special finance fraternity Phi Beta con game. And lastly, because as we saw, the global financial crisis repeated so many of the same mistakes that led to Enron. 
I'm pretty sure this is going to happen again. So my recommendation to all of you is to stay angry. Thank you.